There is more air somewhere as well, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm Patricia Hennigan. I'm a seminarian and an aspirant to UU ministry. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Princeton, where in our open and welcoming community, we live our message of hope, love, justice, and joy. We extend a special welcome today to our visitors. We're glad that you're here, and we invite you to stop by our welcome table after worship in Robinson Lounge so that you can so that we can answer your questions and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, Robinson Lounge is right outside these doors. Again, welcome to our congregation. We're very happy that you've joined us. And we do have a few announcements this morning. From the Rainbow Ministry, come beat the heat with the Rainbow Ministry at their annual summer picnic. Our friends at the Bayard Rustin Center are graciously hosting us for a potluck at their space on 12 Stockton Street in Princeton. That is on Sunday, July 28th from 12 to 2.30 p.m. Feel free to bring any meat-free dishes you like, hang out with your friends from the congregation, and check out the Bayard Rustin Center's mission. So this is open to any members of the congregation, but it is for the Rainbow Ministry. Contact Judy V or Susanna Pell for questions. And we have kind of a big thing coming up, it sounds like, thanks to our own Steve Valerio, host of UU Princeton's monthly Zen practice and discussion. UU Princeton is proud to host a group of Buddhist monks of God and Shartzi from August 20th to the 25th for public events, including the construction of a sand mandala, a butter sculpture workshop for UU Princeton children and youth during Sunday worship, and Dharma talks on Buddhist teachings. All donations collected during this visit will support the Godin Monastery, founded in Tibet in 1409 and currently located in Mungad, India. This is coming up fast, so please start to spread the word. Visit the UU Princeton main webpage for a full schedule and details. There are flyers in the lobby you can take to hang in your local community and pass on to friends. And we will need lots of volunteers to make this public event a success. A volunteer sign-up genius will soon be posted on our website. If you can contribute food for lunch or dinner or help with ushering, ticketing, and tabling during this visit, please sign up. That is August 20th to 25th. Last night, former President Donald Trump was shot at a political rally near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was hit in the ear and he appears to be doing well. As you use, we condemn all forms of political violence. Violence begets violence and it has no place in a democracy. We hope for a full recovery for Mr. Trump. We also send our care and condolences to the others who were injured or killed at the rally last night. May they and their families have strength and peace and may our country respond with care and peace. And now our chalice lighting. This is a congregation of open minds, of helping hands, and of loving hearts. To get, wait a minute, I'm doing this wrong. One moment. Yeah. Oh, that's first. Okay, I've only been doing this for thirty years, so uh, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Martin Luther King Jr. This is a congregation of open minds, of helping hands, and of loving hearts. Together, we care for our earth and work for friendship and peace in the world. Let us enter a time of quiet meditation. Spirit of life and love, we hold in our hearts the joys and sorrows brought forward here this morning, and those that are left unsaid. May we know and feel the care of others as we go through our days, and when we are strong, may we provide the care that others need. Let us take this moment to open our hearts to the love that surrounds us 
in our relationships, in nature that sustains us, and the love that surpasses understanding. Amen. Among my friends, most of whom are indifferent <laughs> to religion, I sometimes describe myself as a religious fanatic. I love Bill's line about being religious, but not spiritual, reversing the usual American cliche. Describing myself as a UU religious fanatic sounds ridiculous, so it has spurred conversations about what being religious ought to mean. My UU experience grounds, among other things, a striving for courage and commitment to engage with the other when part of me would rather retreat. It means striving for love when part of me would prefer safety. Last December, after one such conversation, a friend forwarded me an article in the Financial Times entitled, the Culture Wars Dividing America's Most Liberal Church. The article began with the story of a UU minister who on the final day of the 2019 UUA General Assembly widely distributed a booklet called The Gadfly Papers, a stinging attack on UUA leadership, arguing that the UUA was driving the church in an illiberal, dogmatic, intolerant, and identitarian direction, and that it had become a self-perpetuating echo chamber that prioritized emotional thinking over logic and reason. The issue at hand, the article claimed, was the UUA's approach since the 1990s to placing fighting racism at the center of our principles, of our purposes. The piece included interviews with UU leadership on both sides of the schism in our denomination and illuminated just how hard it can be to keep love at the center when values are at stake and the stakes are high. Patricia told me that 500 ministers signed a letter opposing the Gadfly papers soon after they were circulated, including Rev. Bill. The article suggested a number of UU congregations are considering leaving our denomination. Emotions are running high on both sides of the cultural divide. Perhaps oddly, this put me in mind of my relationship with my friend Luca, not his real name. When I met him nearly 15 years ago, Luca was a visibly disturbed 21-year-old, a brilliant, iconoclastic high school dropout, hyper-masculine, hard-drinking, oppositional, and sometimes violent, Luca is the opposite of me in nearly every way. He is also one of my closest friends. I've held him while he's cried, and he's become part of my family, staying in our house for months at a time when we travel. I once called him at work to deal with a huge spider in the living room I couldn't face. This is literally the gayest thing you've ever asked of me. As my husband and I watched him sweep it up. I clearly remember Lucas and my first wide-ranging conversation, sitting together in our library when he shared a truly offensive racist trope with me. I was astonished, and he seemed astonished that I was astonished. Everybody knows that, he said. My first impulse, which fortunately I didn't follow, was to get him out of my house. I remember saying instead, yes, everyone knows that, everyone who's extremely ignorant and racist. And I remember wondering whether I could muster the investment of love that a mentoring friendship with Luca would require. He looked hurt and confused. And the love and sympathy he raised in me then and has continued to raise in me through hundreds of shouted arguments, much laughter, and many tears has become part of the meaning of my life, an essential part. 
After discussing that piece in the Financial Times, my husband, Michael, asked if I was worried about the future of our denomination. I thought of our relationship with Luca and many other relationships that have at times required courage and commitment grounded in something other than the values that support my ego. I realized again that my striving to keep love at the center of relationships, even when values are threatened and the stakes seem, to ha seem high, is actually grounded more in my experience as a UU than in any other place I could identify. <laughs> Maybe that's what I acknowledge when I call myself a UU religious fanatic. You know, I replied to Michael, I'm not worried. We'll be fine. Thank you so much for the beautiful music, Courtney and Sue. We are really blessed by our music program here. At General Assembly, the annual denominational meeting in June, UUs voted to update Article 2 of our bylaws. The update followed a three-year process of discussion with thousands of UUs examining our values and theology. The change required a two-thirds vote to approve, and it received 80% of the vote. Reviewing Article 2 every 15 years is a mandate of our bylaws. An openness to transformation is one of the differences between a conservative tradition and a liberal one. Conservative traditions believe that the truth has already been revealed and that revelation is sealed. There's nothing wrong with that per se. Applying the wisdom of your ancestors can be a rich way of navigating life, depending on how you do it. In liberal traditions, we believe that truth continues to be revealed, that things change, and we can create and be responsive to that change. Article 2 has been reviewed a few times since 1984 when it was last updated, but this is the first major change in 40 years. The old Article 2 was the statement of our beloved seven principles and six sources. For some folks, replacing the principles is, a, is difficult to accept. It's important to note that the seven principles or eight principles for some congregations, including ours, are incorporated into the new Article 2, and we can continue to use the principles individually or congregationally. They can continue to be part of our philosophy or theology. We aren't casting them aside. We are just racking focus. In video and film production, there's a visual effect that directors use called racking focus or pulling focus. For example, in the movie Young Victoria, there's a scene where Princess Victoria and Prince Albert are playing chess in the foreground. And then the camera racks focus. They become blurry. And behind them, all of Victoria's relatives come into focus as they watch them play. And it's clear that they are plotting something. And then the focus switches back to Victoria and Albert, and the family goes out of focus. You have seen this effect a million times. Directors use it to draw your attention to important parts of the story. All the characters were in frame all the time, but the director drew your eyes to them intentionally. In our case, we are racking focus to elements of our faith that have been on the scene for a long time sometimes as bit players, sometimes as leading characters, but often in the background. The seven principles will remain in the picture, but they will no longer be the primary focus. Those elements we are drawing into focus are now called our shared values. You should have received a printout uh, of article of the new Article 2 language with your order of service. You can read that at your leisure. Uh, it's just for your... For your uh, convenience. Folks on Zoom, there will be a link to the final language in the chat. And you should also be able to see on screen or on the cover of the order of service or in the printout, the flower graphic that visually represents the values with love at the center. Our newly articulated shared values are justice, equity, transformation, pluralism, interdependence, and generosity. You will sometimes hear them referred to by the acronym JetPig. That is probably going to become something that's very popular in um, uh, religious education for children. 
Um, if you think of the programs and ministries you are already involved in, you will see that we have been living into these values for a long time. And then there is love. Article 2 says love is the power that holds us together and is at the center of our shared values. Centering love in our faith is not new either. Universalists proclaimed universal grace instead of universal sin, believing a God of love would not condemn us to eternal damnation. In 1532, Miguel Cervantes, one of our anti-Trinitarian theological forebears, wrote, Faith is with respect to God, love is with respect to God and to our neighbor. There is nothing that makes us more like God than love because God is love. Loving, not believing, is a property of divine nature. Not everyone will resonate with that language now, but we can see the deep roots of love as an important theological concept. And then, of course, there is the golden rule, which predates all of this and exhorts us in a deceptively simple way to love your neighbor as yourself. I had heard that love was the most repeated word in our hymnal, so I did a quick search of key concepts in a digital copy of the hymn book, Singing the Living Tradition. And the word love did appear more than any other word I searched for at 468 times. Earth appeared 335 times. God appeared, so to speak, 302 times. Joy appeared 165, humanity appeared 28 times, human 54 times, the word justice appeared 38 times. So love is an important part of how we express our faith through music. But what is love? I just want to mention that Reverend Bill has set love as the congregational theme for the month of August. I'm pretty sure we're going to resolve everything that there is to know about love in this service. But don't tell him. We'll just let him go on with the theme for August. What is love? What does it mean to you? What does love look like in your life? At its most familiar, love is an emotion. It connects us to our families and friends in a circle of care. Think now about the love at the center of Unitarian Universalism. What does that look like? The love we are talking about as you use that is exemplified in the values is a love that connects us all, that interconnects us all in a web of interdependence. It is expressed through us and it is also beyond us. There is in one of Reverend Jennifer's favorite phrases, an abiding love that holds us all. Reverend Adam Robersmith in the new book, Love at the Center, a compilation of essays by UU ministers and thought leaders says, love is what allows the world to exist. It holds all things together and makes existence coherent. Love is relationship at its best, a way of being that requires a relational power, a power that values and respects that which it connects. For Robert Smith, this is not an abstract theology. He is an eco-theologian. So he sees interconnection and relationality at work in the natural world. He zooms in on interconnection at the smallest levels when he says this, the profound relatedness of fungal mycelium and tree roots of intestinal flora and animals provides mutual benefits and thriving for each. Ecological balance reveals the value of each interconnected part. The relational nature of existence is a reflection of the divine. And I can bet that is one of the few times you will hear the phrase intestinal flora in a sermon. Zooming out to a wider frame, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, the most recent past president of the UUA, reminds us that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called us to build the beloved community, animated by an overflowing love and care for all people, a community that seeks the fullest unfolding of each human personality, as well as a community that cannot tolerate conditions of poverty, racism, and discrimination because of the ways these inhibit the full development of humanity. When Drake gave his reflection, he talked about people criticizing the current um, values because they center racism and discrimination um, as things we are against. 
that is justice. Susan Frederick Gray says the centrality of love begins to point to the deeper why behind our justice work. We work for justice because we center love in our religious lives. Our justice value says we are committing to dismantling racism and all forms of systemic oppression. We are committing a, to a life-giving love that calls us to liberate ourselves, our congregations, our communities, and the world from the death-dealing oppressions of power and extreme profit. Bell Hooks, the author and social critic, names these threats as an interconnected system of domination and oppression that consists of imperialism, white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy. Accepting that loving the world means confronting some of the systems that benefit us is not easy. Loving this world is no small commitment, and it requires courage and, for some, sacrifice. It requires courage because if loving is caring for others, to me, the opposite of love is extreme self-centeredness. And we live in a time where self-centeredness has taken center stage and threatens our public lives as well as our personal safety and well-being. Every day we see politicians who make choices based more on their own needs than the needs of their constituents. Authoritarianism is a renewed danger. The rich get richer and the poor are getting poorer. It was ever thus, but the disparities grow by the day. We can quantify it. According to Oxfam in 2023, the wealth of the world's billionaires grew by, by $2.7 billion per day. $2.7 billion per day. The, people's, the Poor People's Campaign tells us that a family of four needs to earn over $25 an hour to meet their basic needs, but nearly one-third of the workforce earns less than $15 an hour. In the U.S., protection of self-interest often takes political form as gerrymandering, voter suppression, and governmental policy that curtails or denies the rights of specific groups. The LGBTQ plus community is a particular focus at the moment. Hundreds of anti-trans bills are considered each year at various levels of government. The right to access abortion by women and people who can get pregnant was greatly limited by the Supreme Court in the Dobbs versus Jackson decision, and it's unclear what the future holds for other reproductive rights. Voter suppression laws disproportionately impact people of color, students, the elderly, and people with disabilities. And with all that, the threat of violence feels and is more and more present. We saw that last night outside Pittsburgh, and we hold our breath for how this will play out. Loving the world comes with risks, even on a personal level. Drake pointed out in his reflection that guiding his beloved friend Luca to educate him on racism to commitment, time, and love to do, a commitment he wasn't sure that he was ready to make, but ultimately did and continues to do. Centering love doesn't just mean fixing the world out there, though. Perhaps the hardest part is looking at ourselves. You use of color have been calling for us to recognize white supremacy culture in ourselves and our congregations. White supremacy culture shows up in many ways. Some of its hallmarks are perfectionism, worship of the written word, paternalism, either or thinking, individualism, a dedication to objectivity, the right to comfort, and defensiveness. I might add those characteristics also contribute to anxiety. Users of color ask us to recognize these things in ourselves and our congregations and to take steps to heal and move away from harmful practices, which we can do by developing a culture of appreciation, including process goals and value statements in our work, appreciating different styles of working, including folks in decision-making, avoiding simplifying complex decision, and prioritizing teamwork, to name a few. Many members of UC UUCP have begun this work through programs offered by Reverend Bill, as well as our Racial Justice Committee. This work is hard and personal. Nobody is going to thank you for it. And like many things, you may only be noticed when you make mistakes. And yet doing this work is a manifestation of love through our values of pluralism, equity, transformation, and justice. Loving the world is one reason why I'm a Unitarian Universalist. Working together in large ways and small increases the power of our efforts, 
Even the efforts I make on my own within the disability community, I am animated by our UU principles and now our UU values. I bring those values with me into every space to the best of my ability. I am grateful that we have a, a faith that is not only willing to grow and change, but is mandated by our forebears to transform by reviewing Article 2 every 15 years. This process can be frustrating, but it's also amazing that we created a statement of faith that is unabashedly focused on love. And we aren't alone in this work. Many individuals, religious groups, and social groups are also committed to justice, pluralism, and the building of the beloved community. We are now in the first act of our new values. It's the beginning of our exploration of what it means to put love at the center with intention. We need this change now. We need more love now when it feels like the world is on fire. We were made for times such as these. Thank you for sticking it out. Heat and humidity. Um, stay standing as you're willing and able for the benediction. At the end of our hour, we extinguish the chalice. We extinguish the chalice, knowing that its light carries us until we gather again. Go forth grateful for the moments before you, the breath within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you towards lives of greater love, beauty, and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with neighbor and stranger by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace and amen. <laughs>